forces that created Earth still rule it. Around the globe sweeps a volatile atmosphere. And within, a fiery world still burns. Floating on this semi-molten interior, the plates of the crust are forever in motion. Only in a thin layer between the inner heat and the atmosphere could life arise and thrive, yet always at the mercy of these colossal forces. Erupting from the depths, shaking the solid ground, descending from the sky. We cannot control such power, but we can use our human powers of invention and discovery to learn, to understand, and to survive. There are places where primal forces are still on display, where lava streams freely from the Earth's interior. Yet these same forces can also erupt suddenly, unpredictably, with terrible consequences.
For hundreds of years, the volcano called Sufrir Hills on the Caribbean island of Montserrat was dormant. But in 1995, some 12,000 islanders discovered they were living on a time bomb. Situation has escalated. This followed a major ash fall at just after 8 o'clock this morning. The scientists have told us that they can no longer guarantee it's six hours notice. All incoming data are being processed on a near real-time basis. Because the volcano can just go off with little or no warning. Deadly cascades of ash, gas, and lava rocks called pyroclastic flows raced down the mountain at temperatures as hot as a thousand degrees. The eruptions continued, burying the capital of Plymouth under ash. But there was time to evacuate the population of about 4,000, and no lives were lost here. Yet outside the city, pyroclastic flows killed 19 people who had ignored the warning. All of the evidence suggests that the dome is increasingly unstable. Collapse seems imminent. Warnings from the scientists convinced the government to begin evacuations. On a July night, it happens. and ash clouds rocketing 10 miles high. Because of the warnings, not a single life is lost. But there is another kind of event caused by forces below 
that is even harder to predict and far more dangerous. Among the places at greatest risk is a heavily populated part of Turkey, where shifting plates of Earth's crust meet along a thousand mile seam. It's called the North Anatolian Fault, and it can produce a sudden catastrophe, one of the deadliest of all natural disasters, an earthquake. If we could pull the plates apart and descend within, we'd see that 10 or 15 miles down, they begin turning into extremely hot putty-like rock, sliding in opposite directions atop the semi-molten interior farther below. Somewhere along the fault, the plates lock together, and over long periods of time, enormous pressure builds. Eventually, they break loose and rip past one another, unleashing powerful waves of energy that race through the crust, shaking the surface above. Nearly atop the fault, lies one of the world's great cities, Istanbul, Turkey, which has been jolted by earthquakes across recorded history. In the heart of the city, one remarkable structure has remained standing through 14 centuries of quakes. The Hagia Sophia is an enduring marvel of art and architecture. It's also a treasure house of geologic history. Since ancient times, the clerics of Hagia Sophia kept records of their earthquake repairs. Such a chronology of quake dates and damage, combined with other data, we might discover a pattern that could help us forecast quakes. It turned out that 11 major quakes in the last 60 years had occurred in a largely westward progression. We went out to take a look at each quake site, and we began to form an idea about how built-up stress, where the plates are locked, suddenly gets moved during an earthquake. We turned our data into a computer model of stress being transferred by a quake, with red showing where stress increased along the fault and blue where stress was relieved. Suddenly, the puzzle pieces fit together. With each quake, stress didn't just dissipate, but moved down the fault where it concentrated again. And, and in most cases, a major quake struck in the red zone where stress had increased. suggested that the next great quake might strike Izmit, a city of more than 200,000 people. And on August 17, 1999, disaster did strike. The Izmit earthquake was a magnitude 7.4 and lasted 45 seconds. An eternity to those who suffered through it. Local news crews captured the aftermath as rescuers searched for thousands of people trapped under the rubble. Thousand buildings were destroyed. Half 
a million people left homeless. Some believe the death toll reached as high as 25,000. The real toll may never be known. The loss of life was caused in large part by substandard construction. In many places, cheaply built modern structures lay in ruins next to undamaged ancient mosques. Almost immediately after the quake hit, the international community arrived with food, medicine, and shelters. Most of the residents are choosing to rebuild in Izmit, but if the lessons we've learned here aren't acted upon, their future is not bright. The most important thing we can do is to build safer structures. And we know how, we just have to make it a priority. The earth-shaking forces beneath us interrupt life only occasionally. But unfolding constantly above us is the clash of great forces we know as weather. fluid gases of the atmosphere can unleash devastating power. This is home to some of the most severe storms on Earth. A Midwestern region of the United States known as Tornado Alley. On May 3rd, 1999, an extraordinary series of tornadoes ripped through Oklahoma and left behind almost unimaginable destruction. I remember two by fours snapping, just snapped like toothpicks, you know? Everybody says, you know, what do they sound like? And it sounds pretty much like a freight train. But if you were underneath the train, the house was gone. And I haven't found the refrigerator yet. I looked out across the street, and I said, there's no houses across the street. I can see until 4th Street.
Many survivors were warned in time, thanks in part to an unconventional team of scientists. It was these Doppler radar trucks, venturing close to the 1999 storms, that clocked the fastest wind speed ever recorded near the ground, 301 miles per hour. We don't know exactly how a tornado starts, but we do know what precedes it. Here, warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico rushes upwards through cooler air, forming a thunderstorm. Some of the rising air cools and sinks or is dragged down by rain and hail. The warm air racing in at the bottom can actually push on the higher winds aloft, sort of tilting them and forming a large spinning cone. Somehow, down near the ground, between the air rushing up and the air rushing down, the spinning dramatically intensifies. The thing that fascinates me is that only some storms spawn tornadoes. If we could figure out which ones, we could warn people earlier. Most of the time, we miss the tornadoes. It's incredibly difficult. Near the end of one recent season, the team received word that a violent storm was developing, one that might spawn an outbreak of tornadoes. After years of near misses, Josh Werman's team was in perfect position. And this storm was cooperating. First time ever, the team succeeded in recording with two Doppler radars conditions within a storm at the moment the tornado formed. The data will take years to analyze, but it promises to help unravel the secret of how this tornado was born. It was a victory for science, for Josh Werman and his crew, and for those whose lives will one day be safe because of their efforts.